John chapter 60, verse... Wait, John chapter 6. There's not a John 60. John chapter 6, verse 60. Uh, I'm going to start tonight, and Lord willing, over the next few weeks, I want to look at the idea of hard sayings of Jesus. Jesus said some really nice things, didn't He? Like, turn the other cheek. Or... Love your neighbor as yourself. Or even, even more nice, love your enemy. Uh, Jesus, had, Jesus talked about love a lot. He talked about the poor. He talk, talked about, he helped widows and orphans. I mean, Jesus uh, did a lot of really nice things. And Jesus also said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. And he said, let the dead bury the dead. And Jesus, so Jesus had a lot of really nice things to say. And then occasionally, Jesus had some really hard things to say. Some things that give you pause and are meant to give you pause. And so over the next few weeks, I want to look at this idea of some of the hard sayings of Jesus. And we're going to unpack those and look at those things. Man, I hope it will give us a little better insight into Jesus Christ, who He is and why He came. Verse 60 of John chapter 6. In, it, this highlights one of those. Matter of fact, this is a part of Scripture where they say that. Boy, that's a hard saying. And we're going to talk about that saying and what it means and what it entails. But John chapter 6 verse 60 says this. Many therefore of His disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. I pray, Lord, that you'd use your word and your spirit. You'd make us more like Jesus Christ and less like the old person we used to be. And if somebody here is lost, I pray that tonight will be the night they come to know you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for all these things and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the end of the story here that we just read. This is the end of the story. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And... uh, as a matter of fact, some of sayings like this, some people leave when Jesus says things like this. Some, some of his followers actually quit following him. But I want to take you back to the, the first part of this chapter and look at how these sayings unfolded here. So I'm not going to read all of this. We're going to read some of it as we go. I'm not going to read all of it to you. So you're going to have to trust that I have actually read this chapter and know what's in it on some of these things. Now here's one of the things you're going to have to believe that I actually read this before I prepared this Bible study. Verses 1 through 15, that's the feeding of the 5,000. You're going to have to trust me. (laughs) I promise, I read this chapter, and verses 1 through 15 tell us about the feeding of the 5,000. And as a matter of fact, it was actually more than 5,000. The Bible says 5,000 men. They divided them up by course and household, and so... This was actually 5,000 men. There were women and children there as well. It was actually more than 5,000. We don't know how many, so we say the feeding of the 5,000. I guess it wouldn't sound quite right if we said the feeding of the more than 5,000. That just quite, couldn't, wouldn't quite roll off the tongue as well, would it? So Jesus feeds 5,000 people. He takes five loaves of bread, two fish, and He feeds 5,000 people. Verse 15 Well, look at verse 14, and verse 14 says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So they see this miracle, and they say to themselves, This is the prophet, and they come, and they're going to make Jesus king And they're going to do so by force. That's their plan. To make Jesus king by force. And so Jesus leaves. And uh, I I tell you what, let's hang on to that. So they see the miracle, and they're going to make Him king. Hang on to that, because the rest of this that unfolds falls out of that interpretation of the miracle. That's Their response to the miracle is to take Him by force and to make Him king. Now, what happens is, he sends his disciples away. He goes away privately by himself. Sends his disciples, go on to the other side of the lake. They start out on the water. 
There's, Jesus comes to them walking on the water. That's verses 16 through 24. He comes walking on the water. And you know that you remember that part of the story too. So now we see two miracles. We see the feeding of the 5,000. Then we see the walking on the water. Although the crowd only saw the feeding of the 5,000. They only saw the bread. So Jesus gets to the other side. The disciples are over there. The people, having seen that miracle, want to see something else. Great. And they follow Jesus. So we get to verse 25. When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? How, how'd you get here? Pretty normal question. He didn't get in the boat. And they want to know, how'd you get here? Verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, when Jesus says, Verily, verily, truly, truly, Amen, Amen, those two Greek words there, Amen, Amen, you need to pay attention where he says, Verily, verily. It's always something good that follows. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. They seek out Jesus, and Jesus says something very unusual to them. You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves. But wait, the miracle was the loaves, right? I mean, he took five loaves and two fish, fed 5,000 people. That was the miracle. The miracle was the loaves. The loaves was the miracle. How, do you, how does Jesus separate those two things? How does he separate the miracle from the bread. The miracle was the bread. What does he mean? If you, uh, for instance, in the English Standard Version, if you read that verse, verse 26, if you read that verse, miracle. The word miracle means an indication, a sign. The miracle was a sign. An indicator of who Jesus was and why He came. The miracle pointed to something greater. A deeper truth about Jesus that they were supposed to get when they looked at the miracle, the sign. And they missed the miracle. They missed the sign and they only saw the bread. You see now how He is separating those two things, the miracle and the bread? Because if you miss the miracle, if you miss the sign, if you miss the point of the miracle, then all you're getting is bread. That's really all they wanted was free bread. They had missed the point of Jesus. And so he's letting them know that right off the bat here in this story. You know they missed the point of Jesus because they went to take Him by force and make Him king. You remember? Verse 15, they were going to take Him by force and make Him king. And so Jesus departs privately and goes away alone. They did not understand Jesus. They did not understand why He came. They did not understand what He came to do. They saw the bread and missed the sign. Missed the miracle entirely. Because the miracle is a sign. It points to something else, something greater. And so they didn't see the sign. They just ate some free bread. That's all they really wanted. Verse 28 says this, Then said they unto Him, What shall, ye do? What shall we do that we might work the works of God. The work of God? Well, here's the work of God. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on Him whom He hath sent. So they want to be able to do works of God, maybe even some great miracles. Jesus says, all right, you want to do the work of God, believe on Him that God hath sent. So here's the work of God, believe in Jesus. That's the whole point. That's the work of God. Verse 30. Verse 30 says this. They, they said therefore unto him. <laughs> so Jesus says something pretty remarkable. Jesus says, you, didn't, you don't seek me because of the miracle. You seek me because of the bread. And you think to yourself, wait, the bread was the miracle. But not necessarily was it. The bread and the miracle can be separate things. Because if you miss the miracle, the sign then you've missed the whole point of the bread. You just got some free bread. You missed, the, you missed the point of it. Let me give you an example. 
Uh, Sunday afternoon, we went up to Abrams Creek and we had a baptism. Baptism is a sign, a symbol. It points to a greater, deeper spiritual reality. It points us to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it points us to the death and burial of the old person we used to be and the resurrection of the new person we are now in Jesus Christ. You can see a baptism and miss the sign, can't you? You can think, well, that person was baptized. That means that baptism must have saved them. No, the baptism doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Jesus saves you. The baptism is just a sign, a picture of that greater spiritual reality. Well, the bread was a, another deeper spiritual reality here, and they missed the sign and only saw the bread. Well, now we get to, to verse 30, and another remarkable thing happens. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Now, let me stop here and ask you. So far in this chapter... Jesus has fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And after that, He walked on water. What sign do you need? And they even ask Him, how would you get over here? (laughs) They ask Him that. By the way, how did you get over here? Because we saw the disciples leaving the boats and you were up there. How did you get over here? They may not have seen Him walk on the water, but without question, the disciples certainly had to have told that story. I don't believe for a second the disciples saw Jesus Christ walk on water and didn't tell anybody about it. Now, let's give, let's give these folks the benefit of the doubt and say that they hadn't heard about Jesus walking on the water yet. They still saw the miracle of feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And then they have the audacity to say, what sign show us that? By the way, that word sign in verse 30 is the same word, the same Greek word as miracle found in verse 26. Same word, sign. Same, the same word that, that is translated miracle earlier in this chapter. What sign? What miracle showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? What are you going to show us? And if you'll show us something great, then we'll believe. Show us a sign. And then they... They point him, since he's talked about bread, they point Jesus to an Old Testament miracle. Verse 31, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Well, Jesus, what what sign are you going to show us that we can believe in you? You know, in the Old Testament, our fathers ate manna. God provided bread every day for them. So what are you going to do for us? Verse 34, let's drop down here. Now, well, I'll tell you what, let me, let me look here. Before we get to there, verse uh, 32, Jesus said, And then, verily, verily, I said you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Jesus says, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did when he sent me. Now, I'm, I'm translating that a little bit for you. That's the Scott Lingenfelter paraphrase of that. God sent me. That's the true bread from heaven. Moses didn't give you bread. Now, Jesus is pointing them to the promised land. Now, I'm speaking spiritually here, all right? Jesus is pointing them heavenward eternally. Jesus is pointing them to the promised land, and they're still trying to go back to the wilderness. You, you get the, the image here? They're, going, they're trying to go back to the wilderness and Jesus is pointing them to the promised land. They're missing it entirely. <laughs> missing the whole point. So look, verse 34 then. Then said they unto Him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Okay, Jesus, great. We would like this free bread forever. Evermore, that means always. All, all way, for, from here on out, Jesus, give us this free bread from here on out. This is, the, uh, this is the spiritual Mr. Gaddy's pizza buffet. As much bread as you want, you get it from Jesus. That's what they're asking for. Free bread, as much as you want. Everybody gets it. It's free to everybody. It's like uh, government stimulus checks. Just free to everybody, handing them out. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were all Democrats. Verse 35. 
Verse 35, Jesus, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He, man, if you don't see what Jesus is doing here, you are trying not to see it at this point. Jesus is pointing them to, he's, he's trying to get them past bread and to something bigger. But what you notice is, oftentimes, Jesus' statements about spiritual things are kind of cryptic. You get it if you get it. You get it? They are, they are uh, cryptic so that those who want to know who Jesus is can find Him. But you have to search Him out. You have to look for Him. You have to know the real Jesus. Not some superficial, on the top, surface level kind of Jesus. You've got to look at it and dig and see what He's really saying. And if you want to know Jesus, you can know Him. He says it right here. He makes it as clear as, you can, as, clear as day, but it is, it is obfuscated just enough, obfuscated just enough so that those who really don't want to know Jesus won't. If they want just a religious feel-good experience, come and get dunked in the water and go and live your life and never live any differently, but you can tell people you got on a church roll somewhere. If that's what you're looking for, you can get that, I guess, too. But that's not Jesus. This, this is one of the I am statements that you find in the Gospel of John. There are seven of those I am statements in the Gospel of John. This is one of those. When Moses went to the burning bush, we're going back... See, they took Jesus to the Old Testament with manna. Jesus takes them a little farther back. Before, manna, before Moses was leading them into the wilderness and providing manna for them, Moses himself had to be commissioned by God. He sees a burning bush. He approaches it. The bush is burning but is not consumed. Moses approaches the bush, and God speaks to him in that burning bush, tells him, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. He commissions Moses and tells Moses, you're going to go to Egypt and you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. You're going to be the one to lead my people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. And Moses, I, I, it, now this is in my mind, all right? this isn't in the Bible, this is just in my mind. Moses says, who do I tell them sent me? I can just see this story in, in my mind, the way this unfolds is Moses has this long conversation with God through the middle of this burning bush. And he is told to go to Egypt, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he starts walking away, and then he stops and says, Oh, yeah, wait, one other thing. Uh, who are you again? <laughs> who, who did I tell him sent me? That's really what he's asking. Who are you again now? And God answers him. And God says, I am that I am. Therefore, you tell them I am sent you. Uh, Yahweh is the Hebrew name. Sometimes translated Jehovah, although I, oh, that's another Bible study for another night. But the name Yahweh, or sometimes it's translated as Jehovah. I am. And that, in just one name, in one word in Hebrew, two words in English, one word in Hebrew, God has summed up His entire character and nature in one Hebrew word. Man, that's a, that's a big God. If you, You've studied theology, right? You've studied the characteristics and the qualities of God, and you know how great and expansive they are, how indescribable, how words fail us to tell everything there is about God, and we don't know everything there is to know about God, and God sums Himself up in one Hebrew word, I am. <laughs> And now Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says this in other ways too. I, I am living water. He says, uh, before Abraham was, I am at one point in John. And they pick up stones to stone him. If you don't think they knew exactly what Jesus was saying, you're mistaken. They didn't see Jesus for who he was. But they did understand what he was saying. At least to some degree. I am, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. So, verse 41. And the Jews then 
murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. You don't think, you don't think they knew what Jesus meant? You don't think that ruffled some feathers? I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And the Jews murmur. Murmur is a, it's a word. It's, um, it's an onomatopoeia. It's a word that sounds like what it is describing. Now, I know this is our Wednesday night crowd, or at least a tenth of our Wednesday night crowd. I think the other ninth is downstairs, but uh, this, is, this is a Wednesday night crowd, so I know that you all don't murmur, because only unspiritual people murmur. I know you don't do that, I don't do that. We're talking about those other people that aren't as good of Christians as we are, but those other, some of those other people murmur. I have pastored for, let's see, I started pastoring in 2000. I've been a pastor for 21 years now, give or take. Murmuring never happens out loud, does it? In 21 years, I, I have noticed murmuring in church. Not much at Mount Carmel, but it does happen sometimes. Murmuring never happens loudly. Openly, directly, the word murmur is an onomatopoeia. It describes and sounds like what it's describing. Murmur, 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 murmur. murmur. That's, that's what it sounds like when people murmur. They whisper and mumble and cloak, cu- cup their mouth and turn their heads and put it next to somebody's ear. That, that's what murmuring is. Soft and subtle and behind the scenes and dare I say underhanded. And, and they, they murmur. So Jesus is teaching, and while he's teaching, you hear you can hear you can see, I mean, can't you just see the picture? You can see some you can see somebody's hand leave their side and come up and, and turn to her neighbor and start murmur, 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 murmur. Because Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And here's, what, here's their response, verse 42. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I am come down from heaven? Wait just a second, we know this guy. You know, Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And it seems to be true here in this case. We know Mary, we know Joseph. They nothing special about Jesus. Now let me, tr- let me say that in a way that you have heard that expressed around here. All the Christians, that church is full of hypocrites. That's something like what's happening here. We know those people. We know who they are. They're nothing special. They're no better than us. They're all hypocrites up there. They think they're better than us. They're no better than us. That's the same kind of thing said today that was said about Jesus a long time ago. Now, here's the difference. You and I, at least at some times in our life, are hypocrites. Jesus never was. They knew His adopted Father. They didn't know His heavenly Father. They didn't know His heavenly Father in the way that it happened physically, and they did not know His heavenly Father spiritually. They didn't know He was born of a virgin. They didn't know He came from the Holy Spirit. And they did not know His heavenly Father spiritually. If they knew God, they would have believed in Jesus. And the fact that they did not believe in Jesus lets you know that they don't know God. They murmur. They don't see. They don't understand. They don't believe. Verse 49 says this, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. (laughs) They ask, what sign do you give us? Moses gave us manna. And Jesus says in verse 49, yeah, Moses gave them manna. And they ate manna and they're dead. And that's what you want? That's the sign you want? They ate manna and they're dead. I have a rude comment at this point about all the faith healers that I've ever known. I'll forego that. Move on. Verse 51. That's the sign you want. They ate manna and they died. I'm offering you something better, something bigger, something lasting, something eternal. But you have to believe in me to get it. Verse 51, I am the living bread. Not dead bread. 
Not Old Testament bread. Living bread. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is bread, and you will never die. Living bread, you'll never die. Verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? All right, now they start arguing. Now they're not murmuring, strove. Now, it's moved beyond murmuring, and now they're arguing. They're fighting among themselves. How can, he got, how can this guy give us his flesh to eat? This, this, this happens a lot. Happened here. Happened a few chapters earlier. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Jesus says, unless a man's born again, he cannot enter in the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus says, can you enter into your mother's womb a second time? Huh? What are you talking about? And that was Nicodemus' response. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee on the Sanhedrin, a spiritual leader of Israel. And Jesus says, you're a spiritual leader of Israel and you don't understand these things? You have to be born again. No, you're not going into your mother's womb a second time, Nicodemus. But you do have to be born again. And there's the same kind of argument. What do you mean give us your flesh to eat? How can we eat his flesh? This is Nicodemus all over again. Verse 53. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except that ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So now he takes it even it's a step further. You have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Close, close Stephen's ears. He can't hear this part. <laughs> you, uh, by the way, did, did you know that early on, Christians were accused of several things by the pagan Romans who didn't understand Christianity. It wasn't as big a religion yet early on in Christianity. They knew about it, but they, did, it was, they didn't know the theology of it. They didn't know the, understand the practices of it. And so... Uh, they were accused of several different things. One of the things they were accused of is cannibalism. Now that was for a couple of reasons. Number one, because they often met in, in the catacombs, in the tombs, underground in caves and tombs. Because they were being hunted down and persecuted, and so they had church in tombs, because that was a safe place to meet. And when they got there, they had the Lord's Supper. And they talked about eating the body uh, the, the flesh of Jesus, drinking His blood. And so people who didn't understand that thought that they were meeting in these, in these tombs and cannibalizing people, eating dead people. That's kind of what they thought here. So the Romans thought it, but the Jews thought Jesus was saying the same kind of thing. This is maybe, maybe one of the hardest sayings in Scripture right here. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you don't have any life in you. Uh, the, the Romans didn't understand it. They completely missed the point of the Lord's Supper. And uh, the Jews here in this story completely missed the point of it too. They didn't understand. They don't know what's going on. What's the point? The point is this. Jesus came to die for your sins and for mine in your place and in my place. Jesus died so that we might have life. He gave His body in our place. He shed His blood for our sins. When Jesus died on the cross, He took upon Himself your sins and mine, your punishment and mine, your death and mine. His place for mine. And so I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, to be the Lord of my life, and in doing so, I have partaken of the body and the blood of Jesus. Not eating His flesh physically, drinking His blood, nothing like that. It's much deeper, it's much more lasting, it's eternal. Jesus took my punishment, my sins, my death on the cross, and I get His righteousness. And, and they didn't understand it. And some of them quit following Him. They wanted to take Him by force and make Him king. And Jesus came to die. Exactly the opposite of what they were trying to do with Jesus. But friend, I'm going to tell you something. All kinds of people would believe in Jesus as long as Jesus was the God they wanted. 
Everybody will believe in, in God. They'll believe in Jesus as long as Jesus does what they want. As long as they don't have to change in any way. As long as Jesus doesn't require anything of them. As long as there's no sacrifice in any way. I'm telling you, friend, when you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, Jesus changes you from the inside out. If you get saved and you accept Jesus Christ, it changes everything about you. The entire tra trajectory of your life is different because of Jesus. It's, it's a, the natural result of salvation. You cannot help but change. And, and instead of letting Jesus change us, a lot of times people want to change Jesus. Because they wanted Jesus to be king. They didn't like Rome. They didn't like Herod. They wanted Jesus to be king and give them free bread for the rest of their life. That's what they wanted. And Jesus has come to do so much more. So, Verse 58, he says, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat man and are dead. He that eat of this bread shall live forever. That's Jesus. In verse 60, their response is this, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can hear it means, who can receive it? That's kind of the, the idea of hearing here is the idea of receiving it. Who could do that? This is a hard saying. Who in the world could do that? I, I liked Jesus when he was giving out free bread, but now this is too much. Who could do that? That's too much. Well, I don't know how much is too much when it comes to Jesus, how much is too much when it comes to eternal life. I can promise you anything you have to give up for Jesus Christ is way worth it. Well, we're going to stop there tonight. Any comments, any questions or anything?